Well, my students affectionately call me uh, Dr. David. Uh, hopefully, they mean it's affectionate. Um, but I, first of all, uh, I wanted to just say it's very humbling to be here tonight. Um, I'm very glad that uh, I was asked to do this. Um, but uh, they didn't tell me I would be the only boring professor up here. And I was amongst all these talented students um, that you have already seen and are going to see after me. So um, anyway, thank you uh, very much for allowing me to be here tonight. So we all in this room tonight, we as humans, all have something in common. We are all dying. Yeah. <laughs> now I thought I would maybe lead with a ubiquitous joke to start it off. But I thought, you know what? Maybe I should just start with pure, grim pessimism, right? <laughs> but I'm an academic. I'm a realist. So what I really mean is that we are all aging. One of our greatest triumphs as a human species might be the fact that we have extended our life expectancy almost by 100%, 70% to be exact, 47 years of age to 70 to 80, depending on where you live. Those damn Mediterraneans, they skew our numbers. <laughs> on the flip side of this, quantity of uh, quality of life, not so much. It has not matched our successes of quantity of life. Over 50% of all of our life's health care costs come after the age of 65. So when they say save for retirement, what they're really saying is save to keep yourself alive. Over a trillion dollars of the next 35 years will be spent on dementia-related diseases alone just in the United States. We have more chronic illnesses than ever before. Heart disease, cancer, dementia-related diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and Huntington's disease. We have a major gap, and quality of life is falling behind. So I'm about to turn 40 at the end of the year. So the common life expectancy assumption looks like this. That at 40, you are now over the hill. Most of you in here are climbing the hill. You're positively developing. And then at, after the hill, you are just a life of decline and decay. These, some of our actions based off these assumptions is that we infuse the beginning part of our hill with developmental programs to reach our optimal potential. Yet, our decline and our problems happen at the end of our life, after the hill. So, the aging adult is neglected and problems manifest. But human development and aging literature and gerontology don't agree with this assumption. Development is a lifelong process. You can develop acutely, meaning you can learn a new language at the age of 60, albeit a little bit harder. Or cumulatively develop, meaning when they say you need experience on your resume, well, that's what they're really talking about. You learn from your mistakes, you cumulatively develop. Do we also know that developmental forces can change our life trajectory? and our developmental trajectory. Physical, social, psychological, historical events, economic forces are at play here. And what underlies this whole life trajectory or developmental process are these transitional points, changes in our life that underpin the entire life trajectory. Like going to school for the first time or going off to college, graduating from college, getting married, getting divorced. Having kids, death of a loved one. So these negative transitions cost us resources. We lose something, and it affects our, trans uh, our development curve. So we need resources in order to positively develop. So in other words, to flatten the curve, we need to infuse these negative transitional points with resources so that we can up our quality of life. So what does this have to do with sport? You might ask? Well, sport as a means to accomplish outcomes has been done for thousands of years. Mayans and Aztecs, the old ball game, pop to pop, it was used to 
beside who is sacrificed to the gods. Greeks in the Olympics is used for developmental of spirit, mind, and body. It also was to develop young men militarily. Oops, I can't just get on the Romans. The Romans in the Colosseum for pure leisure and entertainment and also to placate the unruly masses of the Republic. And of course, Nazi Germany used the Berlin Olympics within their propaganda machine for political ideology. And of course, us in the United States, sport and commercialization, financial and economic benefit we use sport for. So those student fees that you guys don't look at, I just heard of this actually this morning, somebody told me, 90% of you do not look at your student fees and where it goes. It goes to the football team. But we're 10 and 0, go Cougs. It is a good investment. You got a good return on your money right now. So sport has an immense value as a means to accomplish end goals. It has been used for social cultural hegemony, for expansionist regimes, British colonialism, even American imperialism. Or for social and cultural resistance for these same hegemonic aspirations. Look no further than 1968 Mexico City Games with Tommy Smith and John Carlos for civil rights movement. We also have immense and mass awareness and interest for sport. The Super Bowl, 167 million worldwide watch it. That pales in comparison to the World Cup with 1 billion estimated watch Germany versus Argentina in the last World Cup. Also, sport has the ability to be shaped and designed and to promote it in a way to meet these means. That's where I come in. My discipline comes in, sport management. Because it only depends on how it's managed and how it's designed in order to accomplish these outcomes. Research has suggested that it can provide resources socially, through sense of belonging and social capital, and increase in social connections. Physically, of course, as a form of vigorous physical activity, and we know the major benefits of physical activity across our life. Mentally, as a way to uh, intrinsically motivate ourselves and a sense of purpose and goal achievement. And it's multi-level, not only at the individual level, but also at the community and even at the national level. So my own research, sport, I found that sport as a resource in and of itself. I asked and interviewed over uh, 55 and older people across their life how sport was interjected into their life at different transitional points. And they said they use it as a resource to overcome divorce, to overcome a loss of a job, to overcome a death of a child. It helped them positively develop over these critical points. And it offset losses that they had. I looked at a specific transition point, retirement. And I even looked at 55 and older communities, in rich communities, by the way, they had a lot of resources already, and the ones that participated in sport the most and placed importance of sport in their life the most were more likely to gain resources and sense a quality of life different than their peers that weren't. The implications of this is that if we can do this at the back end of the curve, we might be able to shift that back end. We can lift it up. And it also can minimize possible individual costs and also societal costs. Well, what does this mean to you? I just told you that you have three more lives to live. Most of you are maybe 20 in here, 19, early 20s, somewhere around there. Well, the implications for you is, can you continue to uh, play sport or get into sport in order to offset the negative losses that are inevitable in everyone's life in here? It's going to happen. Some, we have already talked about it. The point is, if we can, instead of shifting a part of the curve, we can shift the entire 
curve positively if we interject sport participation across our life. So therefore, the curve now looks like this. We can raise up your optimal potential. You can possibly offset some of those losses at the back end of your life and even increase some of those positive inclines that you're experiencing right now. But sport can only be done in that way if sport managers can design it appropriately for your needs. This is why sport management is relevant and an important academic discipline, and that's where I come in, and that's why I study it so much. Thank you.